name is Joseph Carlson, and this is episode 26 of The Grief of Politics. I am joined once again by Avin Carroll. Avin, how are you doing? I am doing good. How are you today, sir? Good, good, good. We had some false starts and stuff, and we we're trying. I'm trying to set up a new thing, so I look at the camera, so I apologize if my island looks over here because the monitors are over here, so I might catch a glance of Avin's face. Yeah, uh, this was Avin's choice this month, and we're going to talk about the Second Amendment, a nice breezy topic that'll just make your Sunday or whenever, you know, this post, what, Monday, I think. It'll just make your Monday feel so much lighter, I'm sure. Um, Evan, why why did you choose this? Uh, not, not, I'm not, bl- I'm just asking what was the, not like, how dare you, but like, what was your, what was your... Um, so I'd seen some recent news uh, just talking about um, recent Supreme Court decision on uh, the Second Amendment, and then talking yep. about how that's going to impact uh, upcoming cases. Uh, as you know from reading through the articles, there's several pretty important upcoming pending cases on mm-hmm. uh, gun rights uh, laws and, and what's going to happen with those, and yeah. very much directly impacted by the um, decision last year about this time that, that really kind of reshaped how every gun restriction law, gun freedom law is passed on the books. Yeah, the the one that, that I took, a, well, not a lot of notes, but some notes, the one that hasn't been decided yet, I think that's a big deal, the one in New York. I think that's yeah. the one that's going to be uh, big. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely always in the news, unfortunately. Being an American, you always read about some gun violence, Second Amendment rights. You mm-hmm. know, the the debate continues, you know. Uh, with, I think gun owners, you know, saying, you know, you can't, you know, this is what we think. And then I will get into the articles. What, what did, reading these articles, what was your like kind of big takeaway though, when you read over them? I mean, was it what you expected or did you read? Cause I, some of this was actually very surprising to me when I read over it. Um, you know, I actually wasn't familiar with the, the, the most recent kind of big, decision that they made last year um i believe it was uh, bruin might be mispronouncing it but mm. I, I wasn't familiar with the precedent that, is that, that the, was actually set by that yeah that's that the new york spread. case right uh that's the new york case that uh was decided last year there's another new pending new york case um that oh right will will have an impact on of course laws as well Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the big one that was decided last year was uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc. versus Bruin. And, mm-hmm. and the big impact of that one was the precedent that was set by it. Um, if I read it correctly, essentially what they said in that was that um, uh, any gun law that is passed has to also meet with traditional historical precedent, uh, mm. which essentially just means it needs to line up with gun rules and restrictions from 1791, or at least that's how it's being treated. Right. Uh, There's which, another article actually that we'll bring in later that actually talks about that, which I thought was really interesting. It was, and I'm going to read passages where I was like, "Ha ha!" Um, but we'll get there. It's like the, I mean, you have, you had a lot of articles, so this took a while to like put this together. And, and they're meaty, right? Like, this is a really heavy and nuanced topic. And, and so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in these. Yeah, the one thing that bothers me about this, um, just the, the, the listing from the US, USLA, uh, WShield.com, the legal defense for self-defense, mm-hmm. and they've listed the Supreme Court cases, there's just a part of my eye that twitches because they go all over the place with years. And you'd think if you were formatting something, you go from like oldest to newest, but right. I, I don't know how they felt. Maybe it was the implications of the case or so, I don't know. It was just weird reading it. Cause I was like, well, this all seems to matter. And it's like out of order, you know, like you mentioned, maybe you don't care about something that happened in 18, 1875 is one of the cases here, you know, but mm-hmm. 1886, like 1939, like all this stuff does matter, but it was weird just the formatting of like, okay, we're in 18, you know, 86 and now we're in 1939 and now we're in 2016. It was like, what the heck? So I think, I think really they're trying to line up the cases that uh, kind of stack on top of each other. Like how does one set a precedent for the next um, 
as opposed to looking at it chronologically, they're looking for like, how is the foundation built? How is the next level built up off of that to get us to where we are today? Right. So I guess we just start with, um, I mean, basically I just, you know, my initial impressions were what I said. This was actually incredibly informative and it actually kind of like changed, you know, I, I'm a gun owner, but it changed how I, because you always hear this thing about, you know, obviously the second amendment and states rights. And it's like, well, why don't they just have a national ban if it's that, but you start reading this and it's the Supreme court specifically says why there isn't a national ban on firearms, basically in all these, um, rulings and the one i picked out was the united states versus lopez is one of them it's from 1995 it's like middle of the thing basically i'm just going to read this alphonse lopez jr was convicted of violating the gun free school zones act of 1990 after bringing a revolver that was unloaded and cartridges which if it's a revolver anyway it should be anyway and cartridges to his texas high school lopez argued that uh regulating or banning guns in local schools was well outside the power of congress under the Commerce Clause and was unconstitutional. But this is what I thought was interesting. But the federal government argued that bringing a gun to school would cause more gun violence and crime, which would lead to economic problems. The ruling, this case was actually a major Commerce Clause case, but it is in, in this list of Second Amendment Supreme Court cases because the SCOTUS ruled the Gun Free Zone Acts of 1990 was unconstitutional. They further limited how the federal government could regulate or restrict gun rights. So what keeps coming up in these cases, which I think is interesting, is that although the federal, the, the Second Amendment applies to the U.S. government, so it does not apply to states. So states still have the right to regulate gun ownership, how they feel, whatever, through legislation and things like that. And so I always think that's interesting of like, and then how does Congress pass like national regulations on gun ownership? How do they, and to me, that was very kind of informative like yeah that makes sense you know states rights all this kind of stuff so mm -hmm. um but i do think this last the last two lines you know but the federal government argued that bringing a gun to school would cause more gun violence and crime which would lead to economic problems which i think is underselling the loss of life i mean this is the grief of politics there will be economic problems but also if, if guns go to school and it will lead to more violence and crime that will probably be the loss of life which is yeah. obviously the most important thing i think um you know um well and right i mean for this conversation that's probably where the biggest amount of grief comes in right and that's yeah. why i added an extra article um i'd done a lot of reading and all of it was kind of centered around the bruin decision and how it was impacting how uh, laws were being passed and how uh tests of those laws were coming forward into federal court uh, but none of them are really talking about um, why we have an argument, right? Like right. if you just read those, it'd be like, okay, well, like what's the big deal? Why why are we writing these laws? Why don't we just not write them? Of course, everyone that lives in the United States knows. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of gun violence in the United States. We are we are a very pro gun country. Uh, one of the articles points out as far as like the Western countries of the world, most of the developed uh, countries in the world, uh, private gun ownership is completely outlawed or extremely restricted. Right. And in the United States, it's like, even though uh, NRA and, and pro-gun organizations would say like, oh, we're way too heavily restricted, uh, compared to the rest of the world, there's basically none. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing too, is I think the one thing that I keep reading about is, um, you know, the NRA, which we'll bring into later. It's a later article. But mm -hmm. the fact that they are advocating for, supposedly for gun owners, but I, I mean, a lot has been written about the NRA and the fact that they are somewhat, I mean, if not all lobbyists, right? Like the gun manufacturers donate to them. And so it is within their best interest to talk about if you're going to get donation from a firearms manufacturer, it's within your best interest to promote firearms. Um, I mean, plain and simple. I'm not saying any moral judgment of is that good or bad, but like if a company is giving you money, there's a reason why they're giving you that money. Um, the other one I actually wanted to bring up uh, was uh, the district of Columbia versus Heller. Mm -hmm. so I have to, sorry, I'm, I'm using an iPad to scroll through. It's actually kind of nice doing this. Uh, District of Columbia versus Heller. 
and I think this is interesting because this is actually a point by point thing of what the what you know the problem. The problem: Special Policeman Dick Heller and several other residents of the District of Columbia all wanted a gun for self defense at the time. This was in two thousand eight. At the time, DC prohibited carrying of unregistered firearms of any unregistered firearms, yet bar all handgun registration which is weird. DC also required all lawful owned guns to be kept unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock, including in a person's own home with few exceptions. Heller felt this ban prevented someone from properly defending themselves at home and violated the second amendment. This is why I think it's interesting because the ruling really is a point by point thing. So I want to read this in the second amendment Supreme court case, the court made several rulings upholding our constitutional right to keep and bear arms. It found that the second amendment protects an individual an individual right to own firearms for the purpose of self-defense unrelated to militia or military activity. And because handguns are today's primary defense weapon of choice, they also, they're, they're also protected. The phrase bear arms meant to bear, to wear, bear or carry upon the persons or in clothing or in a pocket for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action. in The case of conflict with another person Three, a well-regulated militia is not the state's militia forces. So that's interesting. The D.C. regulation effectively banning handgun possession and the law required firearms in the home to be kept in inoperable, kept inoperable at all times, both violating Second Amendment protections. And five, the Second Amendment is not unlimited or absolute. Reasonable restrictions may be upheld, such as the limits of firearm possession, carrying in schools and government buildings, and dangerous and unusual weapons. Unfortunately, the District of Columbia is under the exclusive jurisdiction of Congress and the federal government, not a state, right? There's been talk of D.C. becoming the 51st state. So while SCOTUS made several key decisions on what the Second Amendment means and protects, the case shed no light on whether states could regulate and or ban firearms. So I thought that was interesting. What I think is interesting is they're really carving out like, hey, there's the government still, especially with the schools, you know, in federal buildings, you're not allowed to carry firearms. In Correct. in schools, there's a federal ban because I'm sure of the funding that the feds give to schools. They're like, no, this is also protected type thing. Like okay. all that was really interesting to me. Like I, I thought that was really good. And uh, there's one more. Um, in 2016, there was uh, oh, there was a stun gun. One with stun guns, which I thought was interesting. Um, which goes into like I think later. Uh. Oh, right here. Cantino versus Massachusetts uh, in 2016. I thought this was interesting because this will come up in an article later. Uh, the problem, Jamie Cantino was charged with owning an illegal weapon after displaying a stun gun during a dangerous encounter with her abusive ex-boyfriend in Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court upheld the state prohibition on stun gun possession, stating stun guns weren't protected by the Second Amendment because they weren't, quote, number one, not in common use at the time. So because the stun guns were not available during 1770, whatever, they're not, uh, you know, common use of the time Two, dangerous and unusual uh, as a modern invention. And three couldn't be easily adapted for military use, which seems odd. I will say this, though, the ruling, the Second Amendment Supreme Court case is often let is left off most lists because it doesn't impact it. It doesn't impact any gray areas. When SCOTUS took the case, the facts were so clear that they were able to issue a per curiam decision issued by the court rather than a specific justice without even having to hear oral arguments. To put it in perspective, from 1946 to 2012, SCOTUS has issued a per curiam decision in only 7% of cases. The court made it clear the SJ... C's reasoning for upholding the Massachusetts law violated the Second Amendment based on both the decision in Heller and McDonald. They repeated that the Second Amendment protects weapons for self-defense purposes and not just for military reasons, and it applies to weapons that were not in existence at the time of a founding. SCOTUS also clarified the simple being of modern invention did not make it dangerous and unusual. Justice Samuel Alito, joined by Justice Clarence Thomas in a concurring opinion, also scolded Massachusetts for failing to protect its citizens from others who were dangerous, reminding us that the Second Amendment protects our right to defend our lives in the state when the states are, quote, are unable or unwilling to do so, end quote. Um, if the fundamental right of self-defense does not protect Contino, then the safety of all Americans is left to the mercy of state authorities who may be more con uh, concerned about disarming the people than keeping them safe. So I, what I think is interesting about this, and we'll get into an article later, is that it talks about what was uh, 
modern at the time and what was uh you mm-hmm. know acceptable at the time and then to the the object of self defense i think there's two articles that touch on people that have been um subject of domestic abuse that mm-hmm. were not able to have a fire like the perpetrator the alleged perpetrator of the domestic abuse i i i think had a gun in an article we're going to read. So if they've been charged with a felony, they're not allowed, or they have a restraining order, they're not allowed to have a firearm, and they did. And then two, someone protecting themselves, in this case, sounds like was was allowed, but there's other cases where they're not allowed to have a firearm. We'll, we'll read that later. But I, 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 I don't know what article you want to go to next. But one of the things in the articles we'll talk about later talks about uh, history in the Supreme Court, which is open my brain up to a fascinating thing that I want to read more about that. I hope somebody wrote an article about it or something or a book because it was like a paragraph in that article that just like blew my mind. So, um, uh, I don't know. What do you, I've been talking a lot. What do you, what do you, do you have Um, anything to add? You know, as far as the court cases go, right? Like I think they set a really good foundation for, for where we're going. Um, and, and, particularly with the most recent decision uh, talking about that uh, uh, Kitano versus Massachusetts, uh, I think is really important because it, it kind of ties into and relates to uh, the uh, Bruin decision. Right. Um, I mean, the Bruin decision doesn't talk about that directly, or at least not in what I was reading about it, but uh, it's important to recognize that they kind of exist independent of each other. Um, so, uh, you know, if we're going to go in, start reading into the articles and not just sort of the case law history behind. Uh, well, I just, I just wanted to set up. I mean, that that was a good resource because it, yeah. you know, you, you it, it, we I hear about that all the time about like, oh, like these cases are fascinating and just read them. But like, you know, these decisions are sometimes hundreds of pages long. And to just have somebody to break it down of like, this is what it was. This is what the case was. Here's what the problem was. And here's the ruling, you know, no matter how I feel about the ruling, like it's kind of like, okay, so these are the bullet points that the court found was the reason for this. And I, I was like, wow, this, I hope that we, I don't know if there's more websites that don't just do second amendment stuff, but like any amendment stuff of like, let's break this down. And, you know, that's, I think why we like the Britannica Procon uh, so much. So just so people know, uh, this was from uslawshield.com. Um, the title of the article is key second amendment Supreme court cases. Yeah. I'll link it in the, I'll link it in the YouTube, whatever. So people can click on the source. Joe will link it in the description. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you can go look this up. So it's a good resource to have, uh, understanding the various case law around, uh, second amendment, at least key cases. Right. So next article, uh, is from USA today. Oh, I clicked on the wrong one. That's all right. I'll get it. Uh, it was published. Uh, just this week, uh, February 15th, 23, uh, and it's talking about uh, gun rights because this is right after the Michigan State shooting happened. Um, Do you remember? So the Michigan State thing, I just read the headline. Was it five people were killed and two were injured? Do you know off the top of your Oh, I don't know what the final numbers were. I only saw the headlines that, that was coming out. That's if you're not American and you listen to this, that's what we are. That's where we're at in this debate. Is oh man, mm-hmm. the, this one I didn't. I don't really know because it just keeps happening. <laughs> so I don't really know. Well, it's pretty what, new. One and and two. I I I didn't pick this discussion because of uh, that particular topic. Right. Um. Right. Like we we chose this a month ago. And so that wasn't where I was reading. Right. But as I was looking up articles, this one had just popped up and I thought it would be um, the, the way they talk about um, the Bruin decision and how it impacts things. I thought was very uh, important. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, what they're talking about here is um, uh, the headline is as nation reels from Michigan state shooting courts wrestle with access to guns written by John Fritz. Um, again, February 15th, 23. Um, and then they talk about, uh, how we're, we're nationally, how we're working through kind of these cases and, and what does this one mean for it? Um, 
uh, they talk about a series of criminal cases uh, percolating in lower federal courts are striking at a question about when the government may deny someone um, access to a gun. And they're specifically working around um, people with criminal backgrounds and, and what that means. Like, can we restrict it? Can we not? Are we violating their rights when we do? What, what denotes uh, someone that should have that right taken away? Specifically, people that are nonviolent felons. Uh, right. And, and so there's kind of this, this argument going back and forth. Um, they, they have a bullet point lower down in the article and others talked about this too, that the, the power of the Bruin decision in that it, it, you have to have traditional and historical precedent to, right. to set a law that um, they say, quote, some lower courts are now tossing gun laws that don't have historical roots. Some of the cases will likely wind up at the Supreme Court. And mm. the the reason that they're they're doing that is because essentially the Supreme Court has said if it doesn't have historical roots, it doesn't matter what your law is, it doesn't uh, it's not constitutional. So I have a question for you with with a historical, I mean obviously they're looking at old case law saying, you know, how does this um Effect, you know, they look for precedent, right? But I mean, with the past few years, I mean, in my opinion, there is precedent being set uh, now. Maybe it isn't going to court, but like we're seeing more of these things in the news. So, like, I, I mean, we're not lawyers and we can't really speak to this, but how do you, when you say historical precedent, but then there's nothing on the books to say, like, hey, this is a problem now. What do we do? Like, what do you look back to? And I think that they actually talk about that in an article later, but uh, I don't know. It, it seems to me that th this stuff that is um, historical is is strange, uh, especially with the Supreme Court. And people have been talking about it with tons of different cases where the Supreme Court will pull something from 1800 and say, this is why we're ruling. They did it with um, Roe v. Wade of like they pulled a law from like the 1800s saying this is why we think this way. And it's like, man, it's 2023. 20, you know what I mean? Like the why go back that well it's because that's what the law was but like anyway it's it's we're not lawyers but but i i find it fascinating it's just kind of like piecemeal picking from history hmm. where it's like well where where is your thought process because that was a long time ago you know what i mean even these cases they're citing from like 1939 that was like almost 100 years ago right so it's like what like what like i don't know um i think that's what i'm finding fascinating about all this is like how you're it must really be difficult for the defense in like these cases where they're trying to advocate for like victims to be like well we don't have like something on the books to look back to we can only go back to like 1929 or whatever which is infuriating because it's like what about all this stuff that's happening now you know and i think for the grief uh aspect that's what i've been finding fascinating is reading the correlation between history and the Supreme Court and how they pull from history. Uh, and, and, and how so in the grief perspective that they're pulling, how they're pulling from history? Well, because, I mean, to go to the, I'll just do it right now. Because I, again, if somebody wrote a book on this subject, uh, I keep having to go back to your thing. Um, it's the um, CBS News article. Uh, yeah. Nope, not that one. Not the one that he... It, keep, it keeps doing that. Um, not In wake the of new, Supreme Court, Second Amendment decision, uncertainty plagues, gun laws, new and old. Yeah, is this the one? Yes, okay. So this is the quote that I... Um, oh, I got a pop-up ad right in the middle of the article. Cool. Get out of here. Get out. Okay. Uh, uh, the laws... Uh, this is from... Sorry. Yeah. You just read the title. Um, the laws, uh, quote, the laws, those recently enacted in states, as well as longstanding federal restrictions with broad support are being tested in courtrooms from coast to coast where judges are asked with tasks with evaluating whether they are consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And um, yeah. And it, they talk about the Bruin case. We're seeing a lot of action and a lot of unpredictability when it comes to the Second Amendment after Bruin, said Joseph uh, Bloker, co-director of Duke University Center for Firearms Laws. It's happening in a bunch of different directions, and the source of the change is a new mythology, 
uh, methodology that the Supreme Court announced in the Bruin case because it instructs the courts to evaluate the, constitution, the constitutionality of laws based solely on whether there are in some ill-defined sense with historical tradition. Um, and then um, and then the one thing uh, I wanted to see, oh no, uh, oh no, where is it? Oh no, oh no, I can't find my quote. Uh, uh, oh, okay. No, not that one. Oh, no, I can't read my writing. Oh, crap. Uh-oh. I should have tied these out as notes and not... um. Anyway, hang on. Crap. Uh, yeah. Um, this was the one... Uh... Uh... uh no, this is incredibly thrilling. Um, I will say that I think it was this article that talked about how uh, – man, I wish I could just find uh, – oh, right here. Um, quote, in the founding era, you weren't always – you won't always find laws that, direct, that directly dis, uh, disarmed people for intimate partner violence, so like the domestic violence thing. It was something legislators concerned themselves with. But it would be absurd to say we can't do the same simply because in 1791, women were not given the same protection of the laws they deserved then and now. So, yeah, that's the thing. When you look back to history and there really isn't laws in the books protecting domestic violence, that's because in 1791, they weren't they were as concerned with domestic violence because women just didn't have rights. They couldn't vote, uh, right. you know, and stuff like that. So it's like, what? who cares? Right. So. Um, oh, right here. Uh oh right here this is what so this is what it was oh my god okay i found it i'm excited uh quote this court is not a trained historian the justices of the supreme court distinguished as they may be are not trained historians we lack both the method methodology method bleh, methodological and substance knowledge that historians possess he wrote um the, sh the sifting of evidence that judges perform is different than the sifting of sources and methodologies that historians perform. And we, and we are not experts in what white, wealthy, and male property owners thought about firearm regulations in 1791, yet we are now expected to play historians in the name of constitutional uh, adjudicament. Many of the cor courts fight over new state gun control laws in their early stages, and judges have been asked to block enforcement of laws while leading proceedings continue. So that that kind of blew my mind reading that, which makes sense if you just stop and think about it. But the fact that like because you look at law and look at what is on the books, you don't look back and know what the – like you don't read the diary entries of the founding fathers, see what they thought about things, how they thought about things, how things have changed. I mean there's people that just like that devote their life to law, devote their life to history and say yeah. like this is this is why this is how it is but a, a a judge doesn't have the time to do that so we're asking them to be historians on top of being a judge and and they're saying you know they're ill equipped to basically do this you know if somebody's spending you know 5 years researching a book about the founding fathers you know they're putting all their time and energy to that and then publishing the book and that may change how you look at the time back then and people back then, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, to me, that kind of blew my mind when I read, I was like, of course, of course, you know? And so how, how is that affecting gun laws now? And I, it, it, yeah, it put everything kind of in perspective that, you know, these people aren't historians, you know? And when you hear historians talk about diary entries from what they were thinking, you know, there's no way the founding fathers could obviously envision the world how it is. So like, how do we interpret that? You know, and, and, and like a lot of people say, that's the problem with going back to 18, whatever, to be like, this is why, you know, 1791. Yeah. 1791 to say, these are your property rights. So yep. I found the quote. Uh, I found, okay. I can sleep now. I found the quote. I was going to wake up at two in the morning and scream if I can. Same article a little bit further down. Uh, another quote that comes out. This is from uh, Sanchez Gomez. Um, legislators should not be taking Justice Thomas at his word and understand that Bruin, the court decision, is not a regulatory straitjacket. Doing nothing in the wake of violence out of fear it might be challenged seems like a game of negotiating with yourself at the cost of many lives. Uh, let's talk about Bruin, understand what it means, 
but given that it's still in flux, it's counterproductive to be thinking too much about exactly what, uh, exactly the outer bounds. Yeah. So, you know, you know, because it's so new and because there haven't really been a lot of challenges to it yet, there haven't been uh, a lot of cases coming around it up to the Supreme Court level for them to give more clarity on exactly what they mean in this testing methodology. Uh, right. As they said earlier, it's sort of ill-defined. Um, we're we're going to be in this weird flux with gun laws and what's going on and what's not. I think what's troubling from the grief aspect of this is like, because you have to wait for precedent, like we've just talked about and wait, like you said, wait for things to basically shake out and see what happens. How does this affect people? Okay. Many times this is people's lives. So this isn't just a, oh, you know, we, we painted the town a new color and we're going to see people like it. Like this, with gun violence, this affects people's very lives, you know? So the wait and see approach can have terrible effects and, and after effects, you know? Correct. Um, it just, it sort of outlines one of the bigger challenges that we have in the United States. Uh, and we've talked about the Supreme Court before and kind of the yeah. challenges that we have at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sets precedent for our law. In the United States, we determine right. what the law is based off of legal precedents from pre-existing case law. Uh, and if a law isn't written explicitly clearly, which, you know, happens all the time. but Right, because it's law. I've, I've had to read legal briefs before that weren't you know, not only here, but other places. And you're like, what? Well, and you read them and you're like, wait, this means the exact opposite of what I think it means because yeah. of the way it's written, you know, the law is written. Yeah. So that's why yeah. we have lawyers who interpret and protect and defend it. So it, it's, it's very challenging from a perspective of like, where do we come down? How do we land on, on the second amendment? Now, you know, historically it wasn't that big of a deal up until I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago, there wasn't a ton of challenges to the second amendment. Um, but I think maybe over... I, I was talking about it with uh, my wife, with, with uh, mm -hmm. Carla this morning. Cause I was like, Hey, we're going to have this nice breezy episode about the second amendment. She goes, Oh, that'll be right. great. And uh, I said, you know, we were talking about gun violence and I said, well, I think the first wake up for citizens, I think of the U S or at least people watching the news was Columbine. Yeah. That was like the first big thing where we were like, what? Yeah. Like that happened in a school. You know, and, and then after that, you've just seen that perlet, you know, perlet uh, I can't speak today. Pro too much right. coffee. Yeah, too much coffee, which I'm about to drink some more. But there's that. And then also, um, you know, it uh, kids now have shooter drills in school, you know? Yeah. And and we've seen, uh, you know, we, we had the Marysville uh, Pilchuck shooting here. Yeah, we did. Well, actually very close to me. Um, we've had multiple school, sh school shootings across the country. Uh, you know, we had the, uh, shooting at Michigan state this week. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and so yeah. the conversation is far more public. I think, uh, with the advent of internet and social media, uh, publications, information, articles coming out, opinion pieces coming out are, yeah. are far more common. And so the discussion I think is more lively and vibrant than it's been before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really comes back to, uh, and kind of the big reason I, I wanted to bring it up, right? You know, I tend to have more conservative leaning viewpoints. Um, and, you know, there's this, this challenge of, well, we need to be more restrictive versus we need to be more uh, protective of individuals' rights. Right. And it develops a, a, a difficult sticky point. You know, as a conservative person, I'm a very very vehement defender of our second amendment. Um, I think it is an extremely important part about what makes American democracy work. Now there's challenges to it. We have a lot of, uh, debate back and forth and you and I have, and, and elsewhere around the United States, we really, uh, you know, challenge is democracy working or not yeah. uh, in the way that we think it is. That was just in the news actually. Anyway, that could be another episode. There was just right. like, yeah. Um, but, the, the Second Amendment provides us, the average everyday American citizen, with the ability to be armed. And it makes the government scared of oppressing us because that means that, you know, we can actually fight back. Now, that was the intention of it. But at this point in time, uh, you know, even if we're all fully allowed to have 
you know, AR-15s, AK-47s. Some uh, states uh, you other, are. Some states, and you know, some after states. A wa- yeah. But after I mean, if the, if the federal can... government came out and said you cannot ban any type of gun ownership, the the American citizen should be allowed to own any gun that the military can own. Mm. Even if you do that, like a neighborhood militia that's resisting oppression from our federal government is going to be fighting against, you know, Bradleys, Abrams. Um, you know, it's like escalation. F-35s, right? Like there's, there is no way in reality that we're going to fight. I mean, even armored Humvees with small arms, we can put up a resistance if we were ever to mm-hmm. get to that point, but we yeah. would never actually win against the United States military. So even for me, it's this difficult grappling of, well, okay, so if that's the case, where do we balance individual freedom, the ability to protect ourselves with, but we also have to protect um, anyone else in the country, their right to live, their right to health and safety, right? These aren't explicit, but sort of implied in the right to happiness. I'm, I should be able to walk down the street without being afraid that someone might shoot me. Yeah. Uh, well, I think some, actually we should probably... Uh, mm-hmm. talk about the article that talks about that like you you did link an article on um it was from uh abc.news mm-hmm. uh news.go.com um and i i think this was like a really good article about the link between gun violence and suicide saying that Correct. although although gun violence is bad you know they had several charts which that's how i knew that you sent the article and i didn't send it because there were several charts to back up uh, your point um I do think all of that is fascinating. It, it you know charts sometimes make my eyes glaze over, but there was this oh, like that is wonderful. Yeah, I know. Well, for some people, for some people, they just say, "Hey, let me ask you a question," and then that's the whole podcast. Um, but what I do like about this is the when it it balanced the suicide portion and the homicide portion. This right. uh, chart halfway through gun deaths ranks by state twenty nineteen. That was really good because it's literally like a balance on a scale. And then, um, you know, they had like other, like another color on there. And I, I thought that was well, really good because it's like, you know, some states it's like 50, 50, like gun violence, uh, you know, um, homicide. And then it swings the other way is like, there's more suicide by gun violence than homicide. And, and, uh, by you know, vast majority, there are way more, uh, gun suicides than there are gone homicides. The, the what was it like 60% of all gun deaths are suicide, I think was the actual yeah. number. Well, um, what, I, what I think was fascinating too, is um, this came up with Uvalde, which was they, uh, I will say it was like one of the few times I've heard um, pro second amendment people talk about mental health seriously, mm-hmm. because uh, I mean, that's been something I think at least people I listen to on the left have been talking about a long time. And I think it was one of those things of, man, maybe we do really need to start talking about mental health. And a lot of this, you know, if you have mental health treatment, outreach programs, people know that they can call a number or go somewhere or talk to somebody who's licensed in mental health, uh, you know, um, I don't know, um, like a screening, or they could just talk to somebody and have some kind of outreach. Then, you know, some, I'm sure some of these deaths could have been prevented. And it, it's something where, You know, when I hear people talk about stripping budgets of that kind of stuff of like, do we really have money for it? It's like, well, what is it? What is it worth to you in the long run? You know, is it worth this line item on a budget or like there's a problem? Like we've always talked about the podcast. People are very bad at looking down the road and future proofing themselves or, you know, looking to the future saying what could be a problem. And I I think this remember where it is. But one of these articles actually even does talk about the economic cost of being over something like a billion dollars a year related to gun violence. Oh, um, right. So, you know, is it this article or is it that money? I think it's this article. So the, the one quote I wanted to read out of here too, there's a couple of really interesting things that came out of this. So it's abcnews.go.com that Joe's talking about, mm-hmm. or, or will link. Uh, and it's titled, uh, America has a gun violence problem. What do we do about it? Uh, it's from 2021. So it's a little bit older, but ABC News was basically doing like a series on gun violence. And there was a couple of things that really stood out. One was the suicide. And and looking over here, uh, the most recent data from health officials shows that suicides account for the bulk, over 60% of gun deaths in America. Yeah. Uh, Another quote that they have sort of related to that is what you don't hear about and what people don't assess is for every story of a mass shooting, which is what we talk about and why there's a lot of um, discussion, a lot of passion 
uh, you know, you're getting protests and, and mm -hmm. a high level of mm -hmm. uh, activism related mm -hmm. to gun violence because of mass shootings. Uh, for every story of a mass shooting, there are on average 300 other stories, most of them suicide, that are mm. never told. Yeah. So access to a gun simply in and of itself um, is is a dangerous thing. So then do you restrict that? And that gets extremely difficult. Yeah. You and I have talked about, I believe I've talked about it on the podcast before too. You know, I've, I've dealt with depression since I was a teenager and yep. sometimes it's, it's very severe. And I personally choose not to own a gun. I enjoy shooting. Uh, I love target shooting. It's a ton of fun. Uh, I do believe in owning uh, firearms for personal protection, protection of the home. But I will tell you, there are times in my life where if I owned a gun, I don't know that we'd be having this conversation because yeah. simply the ease of pulling the trigger uh, might have meant that I wouldn't have had the time gap to stop and realize I didn't want to actually kill myself. Yeah, I mean, I, it's really good that you realize that because I think some people don't get to that. They like they don't get to the realization of part of it of like, oh, I can't do, I I shouldn't do, I shouldn't own this or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's the next step of that too. A lot of uh, other gun violence that you don't read about because it doesn't fall into that mass casualty, um, uh, mass shooting, which is categorized as four fatalities or higher. Um, mm -hmm. You know, home domestic violence, uh, other, other crimes of passion. You know, a lot of that happens because, again, access to a gun. Yes, a husband and or wife, girlfriend or boyfriend, um, other significant other may stab someone, but you're far less likely to kill a person stabbing them. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's why I think there is important to push back on those laws that are, um, you know, the, um, maybe Purpose, not extreme risk protection orders. Yeah. Like those. And like, cause it, there does seem to be like, we read the one where it was, it was unconstitutional. They were like, Oh, they like, he can't own a firearm. And it was like, Oh, that's an unconstitutional law. We need to throw that out. It's like, she's in real danger. You know, mm -hmm. the stun gun one, I think pointed out a good thing of, wait a minute, just because they didn't think of a stun gun in like the 17, whatever, like it's not of modern times. Like that seems wicked, right. but at least with that case, they started talking about stun guns. So that was put into the law of like, okay, now we can start talking about stun guns. So right. I guess it's a and, and, and like Erpos bring up real problems because the government can really use that um, to just sort of blanket take guns away as someone's filed a complaint. Ah, we're just gonna take all your guns away. It doesn't actually right. look at the individual situation or cases. And, and it gets real, real difficult when you start getting your second amendment law, because we're talking about constitutional rights of an right. individual that is it constitutional to take a gun away because someone is accused a person of being at high risk without actually going through due process to determine if they really truly are at high risk. I mean, you didn't bring uh, it into here, but there has been studies about uh, red flag laws, and they do kind of seem to work where someone gets flagged as being problematic. They can at least hold the sale of the gun, or the police can raid the person's home and see if they have any firearms, if they're going to do... I mean, I remember after Uvalde, I believe it was in California, there was uh, somebody called like a tip line, and there was some kind of red flag law, and somebody was actually stopped from committing a crime. It was a I, grandma calling about her grandson. Yeah, it was like, I think it was Berkeley. Um, um, the, the challenge with it isn't necessarily saying that they don't work. Because, I mean, reality is, is probably in most cases they do. But they open up that door for constitutional abuse. And that right. gets, that starts getting real sticky. Because if you open up the situation for constitutional abuse, then you also open up the situation it could be tried. The Supreme Court and the Supreme Court shuts right. it down. And now those rules go away and those tools go away. Um, mm. But also, you know, if you live in a state that tends to be real heavy handed about gun laws, right? Like DC's law in 2008 that was shut yeah. down. It was yeah. flagrantly an attempt of DC to disarm its citizens. It was yeah. flagrant. Right. We're going to make it illegal to own a gun without registration. And then we're not going to provide registration. Well, I think I think one thing also, just like reflecting on this after I read this this morning, was thinking about it. You know, you, this is this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Because if you restrict gun laws, people that want guns will still get guns. I mean, that's what people on the pro Second Amendment gun owners will say. Listen, it's going to happen anyway. If you want to find one where there's a yep. will, there's a way that people will find yep. a gun. 
But I think if you um, open it up, then you're going to do whatever you want anyway. And you're going to buy what you want. You're going to do what you want. If you, if you have the means, that's what you're going to do. And so I really think this last article about mental health is important of like, we really need to start addressing root causes of why people uh, feel that they need to, um, you know, people that are have some mental illness or something like that feel that they, you know, the gun is the answer, you know? And uh, again, you know, there's been studies done in red flag laws. They do work. I think, you know, uh, they've been shown to work even in places like Florida and things like that. Um, and I think um, what I think what dismays me and uh, we're getting a little bit towards the end, but I, I think what dismays me and I've told this to gun owners, like uh, my friend of mine is a gun owner. Um, what what I feel is uh, we didn't really bring it up, but the NRA, you brought an article with the NRA. And I feel that they're really the only voice that's talking about this. And uh you know, like we just talked about at the beginning of the podcast, they are essentially a lobbying group for firearms manufacturers uh, in a way. And so I think there needs to be legal, lawful gun owners that are need to be vocal on a national stage about what is happening. Because what I'm hearing from the few podcasts and things I read is they're trying to affect state law, which is important. We've just talked about how there's a federal and state, you know, line of like, hey, the government can't take away your guns, but like the states have to regulate your guns. I, I don't feel there's a national conversation from registered um, law abiding gun owners. They seem to be very silent. And for me on the left, it's kind of infuriating to allow people like the NRA and, um, you know, elected officials who we all know, it doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican, they get donations from lobbyists. And so when they come forward and do this, it's it's very frustrating. I want people that are literally saying, listen, this is my hobby and they want to protect their hobby. What can I do? Because uh, I think that they're reading the worst parts of the left that say we need to ban all guns. I think it goes much deeper than hobby though, right? Like I enjoy shooting from a hobbyist perspective, but I also definitely agree with uh, gun ownership from a home protection, personal protection standpoint too, right? Yeah. Good guy with a gun. Um, you know, we don't see a whole lot of news about it, but good guy with a gun is a, is a real thing, right? It's a narrative people talk about because it does exist. Now, maybe it's anecdotal in that when I say that it's, it's a small percentage, uh, but I, I would be interested to see if we have, I'm sure we have the data, I'd be interested to go back and look at like how often does a law abiding citizen with a gun prevent a violent crime from happening? Um, well, I mean, we do have some data on that, but uh, again, I was talking to Frank cause he owns several firearms and stuff. His gun owner, yeah. he actually had a lapsed membership, the NRA because he's, he thought too, he's like, I'm kind of disillusioned with, but um, I believe, um, but anyway, I, I told him I was kind of working it out in real time. I think the reason why that narrative sometimes doesn't work for gun owners is because that number that a good guy with a gun saves is always X. So like you like math and I'm terrible at math, but like you're in a crowd, you have a gun, you see a perpetrator that's going to open fire on people, you kill them. Right. So like that's crisis averted. The good guy with a gun has killed one person, but when it yeah. fails or it's not there, right. Uh, the, you, you, so, but you don't know the okay. perpetrator, how many rounds they could have fired, if the gun would have jammed, how trained they are. Like all those are X factors, right? But you know that the good person with the gun killed one person. But when you have a, an event like Uvalde, like the mass thing, you can say, well, in Uvalde, we know 21 people were dead. Supposedly that, that person bought the gun legally. We know that in Massachusetts, so many people died because I don't know if that person is legal. Actually, I'm not going to say that, but you know, there were so many instances of like, we know this is how many people die from this. So yes, mm -hmm. good people with guns are effective, but we will never know the true toll of that. But we know the other toll, which is people just dying through gun violence at, you know. And it, but again, even there, you're citing the mass shootings, which we, you know, reading through the article is only, it's less than 3% of all gun fatalities in the United States are, are mass shooting events. Most of them are solitary and the vast majority of them are suicide so you know even their good guy with the gun has an issue because good guy with the gun has a really bad day finds out his wife is leaving him or whatever something. maybe decides he's going to kill himself right yeah so so there's that part of the argument the the thing is is i think good guy with a gun narrative 
doesn't need to be mass shooting event. I would wager that the vast majority of situations where a private citizen law abiding gun owner prevents a crime is probably very frequently personal defense. And I would wager yeah. that a lot of that is, is women personal defense, you know, protecting from abduction and rape. Uh, I would wager you domestic know, violence, yeah. home invasion. Uh, right. Domestic violence gets real sticky, right? Like you might be preventing domestic violence. You might be escalating domestic violence, but yeah, because there's a gun in the home. <laughs> like, yeah, right. something, something could go terribly wrong. Yeah. So, you know, there it's, again, it's one of those things that's super difficult to, to legislate. It's very difficult to regulate because there's so many broad ramifications to it. And the way that the constitution is written is, you know, you have the right to keep and bear arms. And currently we're interpreting that as more heavily leaning towards the personal defense side of things, mm -hmm. but that wasn't the actual initial intention for it. The initial right. and intention it, was different. And again, going back to the quote that I read that blew my mind, the fact that the, the Supreme Court justices are not historians. So back in the day when you're fighting a revolution and you He's write- He's not talking like, about Supreme Court justices. That was an actual individual judge at a lower court level saying that oh, these yeah. justices, period, are not. And this is something right. that we're going to have to do. But but that's my point is like, you know, when you're fighting a revolution against an oppressive government like we were during there, and then you start enacting, writing- you know, uh, Bill of Rights amendments, you know, what have you, Second Amendment, that is going to, is is that moment in history gets changed over hundreds of years. And like, how do you look back on that and stuff like that? Like, that's definitely going to color the way you look, you know, at everything. I don't know. Um, We almost are running out of time though. So Avin, uh, my eyelids has been all over the place. My my eyes have been like squirrels. Uh, what do you want to promote before we take off? Uh, uh, so, of course, I have my own uh, YouTube channel. Uh, your agent guide. I talk about real estate stuff. Um, also, you can just check out my, my website, youragentguide.com, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. all one word. Some videos um, on there. Check out those. The uh, the other thing I'd probably promote would be uh, another podcast that I'm on occasionally. A friend of mine does. Uh, it's called Gaming with Grief. It's hosted hey! by Joseph Carlson. Almost oh, episode 200. We're almost we're almost there at episode 200. Just want to let everybody know. So. Um, there, I, I stole Joe's thunder, so you can't Dang can't it. anything. Well, I forgot that we didn't do closing thoughts. I'll say this, uh, mm -hmm. the, the history thing and the, the, the thing in the beginning, just listing the court cases were, mm -hmm. and the, the suicide one. I mean, they're all really good articles. I mean, I, I don't know how long it took you to go through that, but it, it was pretty great. I'll, I'll say that the history thing blew my mind because if you stop and think about it, it's true, but I never made the correlation between the two. Uh, to the fact that the Supreme Court says that, you know, hey, the government doesn't have the right to take your guns. Uh, but the states can regulate your guns. That was interesting, which I never, I know that I know about states' rights in the Supreme Court, but to make that line and say, this is why I think yep. was interesting. And then I think the suicide thing was interesting as well, that like, this is a problem. And I think it really talks to the issue of mental health that everybody always uh, brings up and doesn't want to politicize, but it is right. important. And I think it needs to be addressed. You know, and I mean, you, th I know you've said it before, but thanks for, talking about that on the pod about your depression. You mentioned it here and there, but you know, to be honest, it's, it's a big deal. I'd like to be open about it because I want people to recognize that, um, you know, the face of depression is someone who doesn't look depressed. Um, I, yeah, I can't count the number of times I've discussed it with people where they're like, wait, what you, but you're so yeah. functional. Exactly. Yeah. You're so like, funny. You, you told a joke 10 minutes ago. Like, you yes. don't know. You just don't yeah. know. Um, and I think it's important that people recognize that, anyone can deal with it. You don't know what's going on in their head. Um, a lot of times we're putting on masks when we're out in the world because it's awkward and uncomfortable. And, and some people aren't, but a lot of people do. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, kind of closing thoughts, same scenario I brought up before, right? The, the purpose of the second amendment is to protect, uh, to allow citizens to protect themselves from a government that becomes tyrannical. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, I do believe also there's a key part in personal self-defense. I'm a huge defender of the Second Amendment, but I am also, like the majority of Americans, a believer that we do need to have regulation in place, uh, like background checks. Um, I'm even a fan of gun training. Texas, one of the most pro-gun states in the country. I don't know if it's changed, but when I moved there in 2017, their laws to get a concealed carry permit, you actually had to pass a written class and exam and I heard they were going to, 
repeal some of those because we did the episode on Texas and I brought that up. And I don't do know that how that went through actually. That back, I'm not right. 100% sure because I haven't, I don't live there anymore. But right. I will say that like if Texas is doing that, why is it a big deal for us to even do that on a national level? Right. To like, yeah, okay, you can own a gun. You have to pass a background check. I'd even go so far as to say we might do a psyche val. The challenge with the psyche val is you could say it's bias. And so there are difficulties in doing that. Mm-hmm. And then not I just, just like... a written test, but a physical test. Like we actually have to make sure you can operate a gun. Mm-hmm. You can get around downrange on target. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, well, and I, I think just the that. waiting period is pretty important because of the fact that if somebody was going to commit something that's horrific, mm-hmm. like in Uvalde, just to have the organization run the background check over several days. Maybe that person has a moment of self-reflection or just, Hey, there I'm, I don't want, it's too much. I can't wait five days. They stop, get the help or just, you know, they, for whatever reason it had to happen on a Monday, but now with the waiting period, Wednesday doesn't work for them, whatever is going on. I think the waiting period is the number one thing. And I think, uh, the red flag laws, if, uh, you know, the studies that I've read say they do work. Um, I think those need to be talking about, but again, I wish I, it feels like I understand that registered gun owners are going to States to talk to different States, but I wish there was a national conversation with the registered gun owners to say, this is what we are okay with. And this is what we are not okay with. And to, instead of, and you know, even on the left, it's like, listen, this, this isn't going to go either way. We're not going to be able to find an impasse. So you have to come to the table and say, all right, let's talk. At least let's talk. You know, this has to stop. We have to do mental health training or something. We have to do something. So I'm not going to take away your gun. I'm not, I don't want to take away your gun. I understand you're a law abiding registered gun owner. What, what do we do? There needs to be good faith. I mean, that's part of negotiation. And, you know, we've talked about this all the time with negotiation. There needs to be good faith on both sides. And I think that's just not happening, which is part of the problem. In some pockets, in other pockets, it is right. It it depends on who you're talking to. So, right. and and some yeah. states are doing it, but at, at a federal level, um, it is going to happen. Uh, the last article we didn't really go into uh, was the NRA predicts Supreme Court will finally define what the Second Amendment really me- means. Oh crap! Um, <laughs> oh crap! That's going to be a thing. Um, uh, what is it? NRA predicts Supreme Court will finally define Second Amendment, and and they're saying mm-hmm. that future case law coming from the Bruin decision is finally going to define what the second amendment actually means. We'll, we'll see if that actually happens. I think that's optimistic. Well, the, so the we're Bruin past the closing one, arguments. Maybe we'll, we can keep running down the bunny trail. Yeah, we'll probably go now. Um, but I mean, ultimately, um, you know, I, I am a believer in the second amendment. I think it is there for a good reason. I think it serves good cause, but we do need to find a balance in society of wow, right. where do we balance individual freedom and rights um, against overall public safety and even individual safety. Yeah, because I know people that don't want to, like you said, you don't want a gun. I know other people that are like, I don't want it. And like me, I have one. I feel that I'm good. I don't need, some people are like, I want another pistol. I want a right, you know, I want a hunting rifle, whatever. Like, I don't, like to me, that doesn't bother me, but I want to be in a position where I'm like, hey, I trust that person to have a rifle or a pistol, you know? Like me, I'm like, I'm good. I got the pistol, like I'm fine, you know? Like I don't need... Uh, you know, until later when I have a revolver, so it's it's really high tech. Uh, but uh, I have gone with my wife gone shooting because I want her to feel comfortable with it. Uh, anyway, we can go on and on. But so next month, I'm announcing right now because I've been debating what I was going to do. And Avin, we did the Second Amendment, so why don't we do the First Amendment? Why don't we talk about free speech? And I Uh-oh. think that the news and everything that's coming out of the news and free speech. You and I have talked uh, again. We talk about doing pre shows, but we're very busy. Um, the thing with the pre-show, I think we just talked for a few moments, the idea that, um, you know, do you, do you want, I think you and I were talking about you and, you know, I were saying like, do you want someone to say something harmful? No, but you want to know that they have the right to say it. And two, you kind of want to know what's coming. Like, I don't like what, uh, like, let's say Kanye, I don't like anything that he said and it made me feel horrible, but I, I, it's almost like, okay, so Kanye is one of those people I just don't like any, you know what I mean? Like I know what they're like. And so people aren't allowed to speak their mind. Anyway, we can get into that uh, next month, but I want to talk about the first amendment because it keeps coming up with, um, you know, to a lesser extent cancel culture, but like, you know, what, on what platform, what can you say? What can't 
what is the role of big tech and all that? How does the government regulate that? And how have they regulated before? I want to talk about the First Amendment. So that's what we'll talk about uh, next month. And I don't think we've ever talked about about it. I would have to look at our episodes, but I don't think it's something we've ever talked about. Topically. I, I, I yeah, don't like we've ever done it as an actual in, episode. In passing, but we haven't done like a whole episode on it. So uh, have a good month, everybody. And we will see you again next month when we talk about the First Amendment. Thank you. Mm-hmm.